We will reread 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. I guess I'm thinking in part about New Year's resolutions and also special meetings coming up. And with the dawning of a new year, it's good to take inventory of our priorities and our spiritual goals. Do you have spiritual goals? Do you have spiritual goals for 2023? I don't make too many um, New Year's resolutions anymore. <laughs> but I do think it's good to consider our spiritual goals and make some and, and purpose to draw closer to God and to grow spiritually. Um, it's good to remember God's priorities for our life. And we see here in this text that God has called us unto holiness. He has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. The theme of special meetings, as mentioned, is change my heart, O God. And I thought somebody might ask, why the need to even pray such a prayer, change me or change my heart? Doesn't God accept us as we are? Yes, he does. Thankful for that. We can't earn favor with God by, or impress him with some good deed. God accepts us exactly as we are. In our sinful condition, we come to God, but because God loves us so much, he does not want to leave us in that condition. He wants to heal us, really. As we consider holiness, one way to think of holiness, holiness is soul health. So when we pray, change my heart, we're asking him to heal us spiritually so it's our privilege and we'll leave the guest ministers to preach the messages on that theme but I, I will say it's it's our privilege to pray take my sinful heart or my corrupt heart O oh God and give me a holy heart or we could say perform spiritual heart surgery change my heart O oh God make me spiritually whole melt me mold me Unto your image, help me to be more like Jesus. Lord, put within me a desire. Put it in me. Do something in me. Do something in me that I cannot do for myself, in other words. When we're praying that God will change us, we're saying, Lord, perform a miracle in me. I've tried and struggled in my own strength, and, and I fall short, and that's what happens for all of us. Self-righteousness doesn't go very far. But when he changes us, he puts, us in the, uh, puts in us that desire to do what God wants us to do. To love what he loves. To hate what he hates. To prioritize what he prioritizes. So, our text here, we see that Paul states that the high calling or the high purpose for all believers is holiness. Or we can say the end of all other callings of God is holiness, not uncleanness. Uncleanness here in the con in context is moral impurity or sexual impurity or sinful or fil filthy behavior. We, see, we could say God has not called us unto sin or uh, living in a sinful behavior or, or, or conduct, but rather he's called us unto holiness. God's purpose for us God's purpose for our humankind, for man's moral image, is to be that moral image that was corrupted by sin. God's purpose is that man's moral image would be restored to the image of God. God has called us unto holiness. Sin corrupted our uh, moral nature. Sin brought death and, and wickedness. We see it in Genesis that it wasn't long after Adam and Eve con committed sin. It wasn't very long that their own children murdered each other. That's the nature of sin, what it does. And it des destroys every life. And Jesus came to reverse what was produced, what was caused. 
in the garden. When Adam and Eve sinned, Adam brought sin and death into the world. Jesus came to reverse that, to bring healing and salvation and to restore us to God's moral image through entire sanctification. So Paul reminds the believers in Thessalonica and also us that although they were living in a culture that was very, uh, well, it was characterized by sexual immorality, filth and corruption, like our culture. But he reminds them that in spite of their culture, they were to live holy lives. He reminds them that God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. No matter how popular the world uh, uh, glorifies sin and tries to take the sinfulness of sin out and to neutralize sin, and, and, and it's offensive to talk about sin. But no matter what the world says about sinful behavior, we're reminded, and Paul reminded the Thessalonians, that God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Christ had saved them, those in Thessalonica, so they would live holy lives, lives of holiness separated unto God. And I want to say this is not an isolated case where Paul makes reference to the need for holiness. We are a, if you want to put it in a category, a holiness church, a holiness Pentecostal church. The people that uh, uh, were there at Azusa Street, they were holiness people that were serious about pleasing God and seeking to, to be in line with the will of God. And they sought salvation. And they experienced salvation and they sought entire sanctification. They wanted holiness. They wanted to be more like Christ. And they experienced salvation and entire sanctification. And then the Holy Spirit descended on that group. So you could say holiness churches focus on holiness doctrine. But it's important, and, and, and I suppose you could write these scriptures down as we go for a few minutes, or you could, uh, if it's being recorded this morning, you could re review it later, I suppose, if you want to note the scriptures. But, but it's important to know that Paul, this is not an isolated case where Paul focuses on holiness. In verse 3 and 4, the word the orig original word that is translated in our text this morning holy, as holiness, the same word is translated as sanctification in verse 3 and 4, which we read during the scripture reading. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification or your holiness, that ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. So here, we see the noun, sancti sanctification or holiness is a noun. It's consecration and separation unto God and heart purity or cleansing that happens through the blood of Jesus. It's holiness of heart. Only Christ through the blood, only God through Christ, through the blood of Jesus can make us holy or cleanse us. But we can, our part is to separate or dedicate ourselves unto God. But we can never make ourselves holy we can only dedicate or consecrate. But God makes us holy through the blood of Jesus. So he says, this is the will of God. You want to know the will of God for your life? It includes entire sanctification. and includes uh, sanctification. And that is the means through which sanctification enables us to properly control or even channel our natural appetites. He says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you uh, should abstain from fornication. In chapter 5, verse 23, we see the verb form. Verb is a doing word, right? So verb, uh, so, so holiness is a noun. It's something. It's, a, uh, it's what God uh, produces in our lives through entire sanctification. It begins with salvation. But the, here we see the verb, and the very God of peace sanctify you. Sanctify is the verb word of sanctification. Sanctify is to make holy. Only God can make us holy. And he says, the, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly or entirely. 
And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. So this is chapter 5. But let's go back to chapter 2, if you will. Verse 10, we see here Paul reminds the believers there in Thessalonica that they had, had observed his holy behavior, his holy walk of integrity, In other words, it's not enough to embrace or to appreciate the doctrine of holiness. We must walk it. We must live it. And he says, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 10, ye are witnesses, and God also. Amazing. Can we say that? Because your family sees you. My family sees me. You're my witnesses, how I behave, Paul says. But also God is my witness. Amen. Righteousness, in some places, refers to our interaction with one another, holiness, our relationship with God. And we see here that he's referring to uh, them witnessing his behavior. He says, and you are witnesses, and God also how holily, And justly and blamably, we behaved ourselves among you that believe. There's the believing side of the gospel, and there's the behaving side. It doesn't, well, I don't want to say it doesn't do us any good. But it does very little good to just appreciate holiness doctrine if we don't live it. If, it does, if the, the truth of God's word, if the word of God has not changed us and empowered us to live in a way that is pleasing to God. So we see holiness preached by Paul. Paul called the Romans to holiness. Romans 12.1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, or by the grace of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's the reasonable thing to do, to present ourselves. Consecration is to present ourselves, not just our stuff. God wants us to, calls us to present our beings, our entire being to him and say, Lord, I set myself aside for you, for your holy use. Just like this sanctuary has been consecrated. We don't do things in this sanctuary that we might do outside in this building or outside uh, 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 in the field. We just, we treat this sanctuary as a holy place. Not uh, just, it's brick and mortar in a sense, but, but it's set apart. We have consecrated this building to the worship of God. The same way we must dedicate ourselves. And Paul says to the Romans, present yourselves, your body, a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice has a choice every day to to continue to stay on that altar. Paul calls the Ephesians to holiness. Ephesians 1, 4, he wrote that God has chosen us before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. By the way, holiness and love are interconnected. Love is the fulfillment of the law. To to live holy, to live without sin, there has to be love, divine love, agape love there, uh, that, that, that produces a desire to live right. That produces a a want to to please God. Not because I dread God, but because I love him. Because I want to preserve my relationship with him. Because uh, just as uh, Christ and the church is a a model of marriage, uh, God wants us to love him and to preserve our relationship, to guard it. In fact, Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, Paul wrote... That Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it or make it holy and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. 
Paul also called the Col- Colossians to holiness. In Colossians 1.22, we, we read that he wrote that God wants, us to, uh, wants to present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable, uh, unreprovable in his sight. Peter also calls the believers to holiness. And uh, actually, he's quoting from Leviticus in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. He says, as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So Peter says, as God is holy, so you be holy. You need to possess the moral nature of God that produces holy behavior. He says, be holy, be morally pure, clean, spotless, blameless, without sin. And he says, in all manner of conversation, that word conversation is conduct. And he says, in all your conduct, be holy. Our attitudes, Peter says, be holy in all matters of all manner of conversation in our attitudes, in our decisions, in our words, in our entertainment choices, the way we do business, the way we do work, the way we dress, the, the way we treat our relationship. Be holy in all manner of conversation in all your doings. We could also talk about uh, holiness is throughout the Bible, and again. We're just considering this uh, biblical doctrine. We could look at Luke 2, 1, excuse me, Luke 1, 74 and 75, when Zacharias prophesied about Jesus, says that he would grant unto you that we, we, humanity, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, and not the Romans. He wasn't talking about the Romans. He was talking about hell, sin, death, the devil, the, the enemies of the church, the enemies of the soul. And he said that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him, meaning God, without fear. And notice verse 75, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. So God sent Jesus to deliver us from sin so we could live in, in, in these days. Not in heaven, but in all the days of our life that we can live in holiness and righteousness before him. Also, we often quote second, and this will be the last reference on the holiness we could be found throughout the Bible, Titus 2. For the grace of God, verse 11, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us, free us, buy us back from all iniquity, and purify us unto himself a peculiar people or a special people or a holy people, we could say, zealous unto good works. So back to our text, notice that God has called us. Keyword being called for a moment. He's calling us. Come on over here. You put your name in there. Hey, John, you come here. Come unto holiness. He doesn't force it on us. If you are saved, you're part of God's church. The church of all ages. And as if we study the word church, the original is ecclesia, which means a called out people. So that, uh, so we have been called out. Uh, we have been called out out of darkness into God's marvelous light. We are called to spiritual light. We are called to peace. And rest. Remember when Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He invites us to peace, to forgiveness, to justification, to salvation. He calls us uh, from a life of sin and spiritual death to life, to spiritual life and eternal life. That's true. But God wants, and he calls us to more than just spiritual life. 
more than just to forgiveness. He also calls us to cleansing, to entire sanctification. He calls us to perfect love, to pure love that flows out of a holy heart. He calls us to, to perfect love that flows out of a heart that has been cleansed from carnality. Well, this is not a uh, study on entire sanctification, though we can't help but touch on it. But we're born with a carnal nature. When we're saved, God gives us life, gives us a desire to please him. We, we're given spiritual life. We're, we're given power to go and sin no more. But there's still a condition in us, that carnal nature that, that uh, competes, even though it's suppressed or uh, uh, the carnal man is crucified at salvation. But it's still there. It needs to be destroyed. And that needs cleansing. It needs the blood of Jesus to provide love that is perfect, love that, doesn't, that is pure, that it doesn't pull against uh, the will of God, but just says, God, all of my being, all of me. I've been, when, when, in, in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Paul prays that, that they would be sanctified entirely. All of me wants to love you. All of my body, all of my soul, all of my mind. I just want to please you, to dedicate myself to your holy will. So holiness is necessary and even demanded in order to have fellowship with God, but God does not impose it on us. We must desire it. We must pursue after it. He's called us unto holiness. Hebrews 12, 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Follow or pursue, press after God calls us, the sovereign God, the almighty God, all-powerful God invites us to holiness. He calls us. He does not manipulate us. He does not guilt us or shame us to holiness. He doesn't coerce us. Holiness is not coerced. You may do some things and feel like I'm living to the standard of my parents' expectations or some church expectations. No, no, no. God wants uh, uh, love that, uh, that flows out of a pure heart. Holiness that is spontaneous out of the heart. So holiness will not attach itself to us. Especially not in an unholy society. Holiness must be pursued after sought after, pressed after. Holiness demands honesty of heart and sensitivity to God's spirit. We have to receive the word uh, on good ground with honesty. If we don't have honesty, then the word of God won't penetrate. Holiness demands conscientious obedience to the known will of God. If you know the, the will of God, happy are you if you do it. Not just washing of the saints' feet, any part of the will of God. If you know it, it's not enough. But if you do it, then you're blessed. Holiness demands, but also produces a, a deep desire to grow spiritually. And an earnest desire for God's word and God's will in our lives. There's an essential difference, and we see this throughout the Bible. Paul taught it. Uh, but it's in, throughout the Bible. There's an essential difference between God's holy people and the people of the world. In other words, God has not called us unto uncleanness. He's contrasting uncleanness on one side, holiness on the other. There's a huge contrast. We are to be a separate people. I believe it was to the Corinthians that Paul wrote, come out from among them and be separate. God's people have, are different than the people of the world. Our views, our motives, our desires, our purposes are totally opposed to the views and desires of this, uh, the people of, the, of this world. The one who is interested in living holy will be constantly concerned to abide or to stay in conformity to the character of God. I want to be like Jesus. That's what a holy heart says. That's what a holy heart does. What is holiness? Well, we've been talking about it all, all morning, 
but holiness is the primary attribute of God. In fact, somebody wrote that holiness informs all the other attributes of God. For instance, we would say God is love, but God is also holy. Because you can't, if you have love, but if God wasn't holy, if God had evil intentions, wicked or, or, or ulterior motives, if he was dishonest or unfaithful, what kind of love is that? So God is pure love that is informed by his holiness. Holiness in man is heart purity. It's separation from common use or we dedicate ourselves unto God. But then God has to cleanse us through the blood of Jesus. Holiness, as mentioned, is soul health. Holiness is a gift of God's grace by faith. True holiness is manifested through fulfilling the law. True holiness uh, spontaneously wants to obey and seeks, how can I be more like Christ? How can I uh, study and understand his will better and, and line up to it? Holiness is not merely conforming to some certain rules. It's separation from the world, from the ideas, the habits of the world, but it's also separation unto God. It's not only uh, refraining from doing evil, but even more is saying, I'm going to do good. It's not enough to stay away from bad. God wants us, he made us, he saved us to do good. To glorify him. And that's what we can do. We can set ourselves apart. But then, we, as we grow in grace, holiness begins at salvation, but it continues throughout our life. But there's a moment in time when Jesus' blood is applied to our hearts and we are saved. And then we are sanctified. It's another moment in time when we are cleansed. People have testified over the years when they were sanctified, they felt so clean. I was thinking, I didn't understand, uh, though I was brought up in a Christian home, but I didn't understand the, the doctrines of holiness or even what a holiness church was. But I sure am grateful that in my early years, uh, there are faithful Sunday school teachers and preachers that taught me to consecrate. They taught me to surrender to God. They taught me th to place myself in God's hands and for his holy use. Yeah. To, to say, God, is there anything else in my life that hinders you from working in my life? Is there anything in my life that is, is hindering me from being what you would have me to be? And as, as I began to consecrate, in different times, God would put, put his fingers, finger on my life and part, something in my life. The more I surrendered, the closer I felt God to me. God desires not only to save us, to forgive us, but also to cleanse us. But not only to cleanse us. Why does he want to cleanse us? So he can fill us. So if you have been saved, he's taken away those committed acts of sin. But then you need to be sanctified where our carnal nature is purified we're made holy we're a ho made a holy vessel why so he can fill us with his holy spirit so we can be the effective witnesses that we're called to be in our generation so i think it's fitting as we look into the week ahead to pray no matter where we are in our christian walk change my heart oh god lord if there's something in me that is uh Resisting your will. You have to change my heart, but I come cooperate. He won't do it against our will, so we have to pray. We're called to holiness. We have to answer. So this is our time to answer. Every mo uh, service about, we close with a time to pray. Uh, the, the, the scripture tells us today, if you hear my voice, harden not your heart. If you sense the Spirit of God this morning calling you to holiness, if you have not been saved, God is calling you to salvation. If you are saved, God is holy, calling you to holiness, to deeper walk, to cleansing, to entire sanctification. And if you have been sanctified, he is calling you still to closer walk, 
to fill you with this mighty, precious spirit that you might be the witness that he wants you to be. Let's have a time to pray. We will sing a song. Uh, kneel where you are or come forward and pray.